Chapter Ten of the Keynote by Clara Louise Burnham. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Christy Luther. Chapter Ten. Nicholas Gain confides. Are you interested in the horse mackerel too? Asked Diana. The two men sat down on the grass near the girls as Barney Kelly answered. Moderately, Miss Wilbur moderately interested. Being allowed to witness anything from terra firma invests it with a certain charm. Barrison has been merciless, I assure you, simply merciless. The man came here to fish, said Philip, and I've only tried to be hospitable. Deep sea fishing, groaned his friend. If you ever hear any tenderfoot express ambitions to go deep sea fishing, tell him to see me if possible. Otherwise, Write or wire me before he embarks. Did you find the motion disconcerting? asked Diana. Barney looked at Philip. Don't you think I might admit as much as that? Philip laughed and bit the red clover he had pulled from a bunch near him. First, said Kelly, you are waked at an hour when all men should sleep. Then you are forced to eat at a time when your soul rebels at such outrage. After that, you go aboard beneath the stars, and you chug-chug miles into the darkness. But the chug-chugging you soon find to be the best part of it, for when you arrive midway between here and Liverpool, you anchor. The sky and the sea begin to get hopelessly mixed up. Why should I try to describe the writhings of all nature? They put a heavy rope into your hands. It slides through your fists and removes the skin, before anyone remembers you have no gloves on. Oh! Let Dante try. I can't. Philip laughed. Then I took him out next day to the pound and let him help draw the net. The smell of that boat, Miss Wilbur. Kelly's eyes rolled fiercely. I'm afraid you won't like the island, volunteered Veronica, who, when she laughed, had forgotten her nose and dropped her hand. My dear Miss Truman, how can I tell? when I'm never allowed to stay on it? This man, when he couldn't think of anything else hydraulic to do, has made me go in bathing in water, at a temperature which no humane person will credit when I tell them. Today I struck. I said to him, do for heaven's sake, do something to show that you're at least amphibious. So he consented to bring me up here to meet his friends, and I shall be pleasantly surprised if you young ladies don't turn into mermaids right before my eyes as they do in the movies, and pop off that beach into the water. Veronica giggled so joyously that the speaker turned away from Diana's serene smile and regarded her. I assure you, he added slowly and solemnly, that if you do, I shall not follow you. So, if you wish the pleasure of my society, you won't unfold any graceful glittering tales. Veronica giggled again, and if she had only known it, her dimples were warranted at any time to divert attention from those afflicting little freckles. "'I can see that Kelly will be fruit for you, Veronica, on that croquet ground,' said Philip. The guest clasped his hands rapturously. "'Do you guarantee, Miss Veronica, that croquet at this island is unfailingly played on land?' "'Hold on, Barney. Don't go too fast.' It's the kind of croquet you play with an alpenstock in one hand and a mallet in the other. It is not, Mr. Barrison, declared Veronica stoutly. Bert has mowed it. That poor little chap. Did you work him in? Good for you. It's what he needs. When are you going to have Mr. Barrison sing for us, Mr. Kelly? asked Diana. Barney shrugged his shoulders. A poor worm of an accompanist can't answer that, Miss Wilbur. But I suppose you will be practicing or rehearsing at times, will you not? Oh, yes. I understand there is a piano in the little casino that was pointed out to me. I understand, eh, Barrison? Philip nodded. Yes, they've allowed me to engage an hour a day on that piano for a while, for some work we have to do. Diana's face lighted beautifully. And may one, may one sit on the piazza? she asked beseechingly. I should advise one not to, said Philip. 
unless one has been inoculated for strong language. I should not in the least mind what you said. Ah, but you would mind what Barney says at times. The verdure about the hall is free, said Diana doubtfully. Yes, if you don't mind a baseball in the eye once in a while, that is where the boys do congregate. He's a most ungrateful ass, Barrison, said Barney warmly. Of course you shall sit on the piazza if you care about it. I promise to restrain my penchant for calling him pet names in private. I have to do it, you see, to strike a balance. At performances, who so meek as the accompanist? Barrison stands there, dolled up in his dress clothes, probably a white coronation in his buttonhole. The women down front, gazing at him and ruining their best gloves. I gaze at him, too. Kelly looked up with meek worship. Like a flower at the sun, waiting for the sultan to throw the handkerchief, or, in other words, give me a careless nod, indicating that I may come to life. At last he does so, and I begin to play, subserviently, unostentatiously. Very few in the house know that I am there. He reaches his climax. He finishes with a pianissimo that curls around all the women's hearts, draws them out and strings them on a wire before him. Then the applause bursts forth. He bows over and over again until he looks like a blonde mandarin, and I rise, but nobody knows it. And when he has passed me on his way off the stage, I come to heel like a well-trained dog, and there we are. As Kelly finished his harangue with a gesture of both hands, the girls were laughing, and Diana was quite flushed. "'What a fool you are, Barney,' said Philip calmly, still biting the honey out of the red clover. "'He plays like a house of fire,' he added, turning to the girls. "'You'll be delighted.' "'Oh, yes,' said Kelly. "'On the road I get a group. I play the Chopin and Grieg, things that the girls practice at home.' and they get out their vanity cases and prink, and wait for Barrison to come on again. Oh, cut it out, you idiot, exclaimed Philip, jumping up. I don't believe they're going to get one of those mackerel. Let's amuse little Veronica and go up and have a game of croquet. Meanwhile, Mr. Gain had again taken his nephew with him to the farm. In spite of all I say, he told the boy, you will bother those ladies at the inn. So, if you come along with me, I'll know where you are. And the lad answered him not at all, but plodded up the road. He did, however, think of some of the things Mrs. Lowell had said to him. Some of the love and courage that emanated from her gave him a novel certainty that he was not altogether friendless. And the wild roses that began to peep at him from the roadside suggested the idea that she would like it if he brought some home to her. In the idle hours of the afternoon he might gather some, and some of the myriad daisies, an Indian paintbrush that decked the fields. But his heart sank at the prospect of what his uncle would say if he attempted to carry back a bouquet when they returned. Gain forbade the boy to enter the house when they reached their destination, just as he had done in the morning. So, Bertie, his hands in his pockets, wandered about the surrounding fields and in the spruce groves, and picked up the shells the crows had dropped and emptied. Once he found a ridge of grass unusually long and green, and heard a whispering, and investigating, found a narrow brook which murmured as it flowed. He followed along its bank until it came to the cove it had named, and watched the sparse stream cascade over the granite and fall thinly down its steep wall. The wet rock glistened in the sun, it seemed to the boy, as if with tears. He threw himself down beside it, and leaning on his elbow, rested his head on his hand. Through the cut between this island and the next, boats were passing, coming in from the foaming waves of the sea to the quiet waters of the sound. Life, beauty, peace. The boy closed his eyes. The longing to portray it all rose in him like an anguish. He felt his old torpidity to be better than this. Why should his new friend stir up a craving for the impossible? She meant to be kind. 
she seemed really to like him, and she had liked his drawing and had wanted him to do more. She would find that it was impossible, and he hoped that she would make no more effort. He squeezed his eyelids together to keep back stinging drops. He felt shame at his own weakness. Uncle Nick had said he had no more backbone than a jellyfish, and he felt this was true. He had no physical strength to defend himself, none to take his fortune into his own hands, as he felt most boys would do, run away and do something to keep himself from starvation. For years he had been fed as an animal might have been fed, at any hour that suited Cora, and with anything she might happen to have in the house. He was undernourished, neglected, crushed, and spiritless. He despised his weakness as much as his uncle despised him, and he was conscious that it was a new estimate of himself that he was now making, an estimate due to the awakening of thought that had come to him through that lady who meant to be kind. He felt very bitterly toward her as he lay there, his eyes closed to the loveliness of sea and sky. He had lain there half an hour when Matt Blake came across from the road and passed near him. Poor youngster, he thought. I guess it's true he ain't all there. The feeling that the boy was not capable of responding kept him from calling out some sort of a greeting as he passed, and he went on through the spruce grove to the farmhouse. Hello, the house, he called. That you, Blake? came from within. Yes, I'm out here at the back. Come in. The carpenter made his way through to the studio, and there Nicholas Gain rose from an armchair to meet him, and swayed slightly as he stood. You sent for me? said Blake, regarding the other's red-rimmed eyes. Yes, and you'll be glad I did when you see this, eh, old man? Gain lurched toward the screen and took a bottle from behind it, and held it out triumphantly. Kinda uh, dizzy, cause I've been asleep and you've waked me sudden. Cause a shock, you see, a uh, shock. He lurched back toward the table where there was a glass. He filled this half full and offered it to his caller. It's a real thing, a real thing, he said. I smell that it is, returned Blake dryly. That's too stiff for me. No, no, again he added, as the latter started to raise it to his own lips, and he took the glass from him. You've had too much now. If you want anything of me, tell me why you've got sense enough to talk. You insult me, Blake, said the other with dignity. I'm a gentleman, and I know when I've had enough, and I know when I've had too much. Some folks never know that, but I do. The carpenter regarded him impassively, and set the bottle and glass out of his reach. Now go ahead. Tell me what you want. I want you to shingle the kitchen so as I can, can cook there. Come, I'll show you. He opened the door in the studio which led into a damp room where the rain had fallen unmolested. I want you to shingle this room. Nothing doing said the carpenter. You won't say that when I show you what I've got here. Gaines' speech was thick, and he took Blake's arm and led him across to a large covered stone crock sitting on a bench. Homebrew, Matt, homebrew. We could have many a cozy evening here when this gets into shape. Going to keep a horse? asked the carpenter, lifting up what appeared to be a nosebag. No, no, that's a strainer. You leave it to me, Matt. I'll give you something that'll make your hair curl. All you gotta do is shingle. You ain't gonna pay for having somebody else's property shingled. Tain't gonna be somebody else's. Gonna be mine. I'm gonna buy the farm. There's a fortune on it. The speaker's legs were planted far apart to preserve his equilibrium, but even at that he swayed so far toward his visitor that Blake put up his hand to hold him off. "'Which have you found? 
gold or oil? he asked, laughing. His host assumed an impressive dignity. Not gold, not oil. Spring. A spring. Of course you have. They're all over the lots. You'd better patronize them, too. You certainly need to put more water in it. I'm going to tell you a secret, Blake, said Gain. Better not, said the carpenter good-naturedly. Going to tell you. I found mineral spring here. That so, was the unperturbed reply. Great and one wonderful water. Don't tell anybody. All right. Had chemist examine it. Says it's got everything in it to cure you. Fortune in it. Fortune! You don't believe me. Sounds a little fishy, remarked Blake. Let me take your arm. I'll aid you to it. The visitor supplied the arm, and Gain's heavy weight hung upon it. They went out of doors, and Gain stopped and looked around cautiously. Where is that brat? he demanded. Do you mean the boy? He's over there by the cove, asleep, I think. Now come on. Can't trust him, cause they're the kind that speak the truth. Fools, you know. Can trust you, Blake. Trust you anywhere. Thank you, returned the visitor dryly. At some distance from the house, in a hollow overhung with rocks, the heavy weight on Matt's arm became heavier, and Gain pushed away some turf and stones with his foot, disclosing a puddle of dark-colored water. He stooped, and picking up a rusty tin cup, half filled it and presented it to his companion, whose arm he released. There, if you don't believe me, he said triumphantly. The carpenter accepted the cup doubtfully and smelled of it. Whew! he exclaimed with a grimace. Course, said the other. Sulphur. Wonderful sulphur spring. Cure you of everything. Had an analyst. Drink it. Blake took a cautious sip. Tell you, Matt, said Gain, speaking slowly and nodding with tipsy solemnity. "'Twas my guardian angel guided me to that spring." The carpenter glanced at him with disfavor. "'One sniff's enough to convince anybody of that,' he remarked. "'At that, it's better for you than the stuff you've got in there on the table. Now look here, Gain. You're going to be sorry tomorrow you told me about this.' "'Wouldn't tell anybody else,' vowed Gain solemnly, seizing his companion by the arm and pushing back the concealing turf and stones with his foot. "'Nobody else on this earth. Fools own the farm put up the price if they knew. "'But what I was going to say is you needn't be sorry,' went on Blake. "'I'm not going to tell a soul. I don't want to be mixed up in your affairs. But do you think you can understand if I talk to you?' "'Understand well.' exclaimed Gain. I'm a man of brains, I'll have you know. Well, if you've got any, use them now, said Blake impatiently. There ain't any money in a mineral spring unless you've got piles of dough to put it on the market. Don't you know that? I should say so, nodded Gain triumphant again. That's just what I'm going to have. Piles of dough. Bushels. Where are you going to get it? Well, I'll tell you, Matt, because you're a good friend and you know how to hold your tongue. That boy out there, that poor numbskull, is the heir to a big enough fortune to finance twenty springs. He is, returned Blake, astonished. What do you mean? His grandfather is one of the richest men in Boston. Went to see him once. Took my proofs with me. Wouldn't look at him. Turn me out. He's sick as the devil. Always traveling round, trying to get well. I wouldn't. 
I would not give him one cup of this water, Gain gestured impressively as he made the ferocious declaration. Just come home from Europe now. Saw it in the paper, he added. Then he'll leave his money where it won't do you any good, said Blake. I'll break the will. I've thought it all out. I'm a man of brains. Bert'll get the money. Perhaps the boy won't want to spend it on springs. A crafty change came over Gain's face, and he smiled. You won't have any say. I'm his guardian, ain't I? And he's non compos, ain't he? He'll be put where he belongs, believe me. You'll have him shut up, do you mean? asked Blake, frowning. For his own good, you understand? Your guardian angel suggested that to you, too, probably. Probably did, Matt, was the pious reply. If all of his kind were shut up, there'd be less crime in the papers. I put it off and put it off, but I'll do it and do it soon. The carpenter regarded the speaker in silence for some moments. Gaines' eyes were closing and opening sleepily. Now, see here, man. You go in the house and sleep this off. I'll take the boy down along with me. I won't allow it, Gaines shook his head. Women at the house pampering him. I won't have it. He'll stay where I am till I get him settled for life. I'm going to take the boy along with me, repeated Blake, speaking louder. You're in no state for him to see you. Where do you get your stuff, anyway? Chemist prescription, said Gain, as his companion drew him along at as swift a pace as possible. Well, next time drink out of your own mud puddle. I think it comes from the lower regions anyway. You might as well be getting used to it. Gain laughed, but rather feebly. He was beginning to wonder just what he had said to his friend. Matt got him into the house and into the lopsided armchair where he'd found him, and he fell asleep at once. Then the carpenter took the partly filled glass from the table and held it up to the light. I'd like it, he mused. But by thunder, that loafer's worse than a temperance lecture. And he threw the whiskey out of an open window. The bottle he placed behind the screen. Then, with one last disgusted look at his host, whose head was hanging sideways with the mouth open, he left the house. End of chapter 10Chapter 11 of the Keynote by Clara Louise Burnham. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Christy Luther. Chapter 11 The Newport Letter. Blake went back through the grove of firs to the cove bank, and there he saw the boy again. He had sunk down on his back, and as Blake approached, appeared to be asleep. The man stooped over him. Hello, kid, he said. As the boy did not move, Matt shook him gently by the shoulder. Bert jumped up with a start. I didn't... I didn't hear you, he said. Then, looking up and seeing that it was a stranger, he got to his feet. Does... does Uncle Nick want me? he asked. Blake shook his head. No, he's busy. You better go down the road with me. He told me, told me to wait for him, said the boy. Well, he doesn't want you now. He wants you to go along with me. I've just left him. Upon this the boy followed obediently, and they walked together over the field to the road. Blake occasionally looked at the unsmiling young face as he cogitated on Gaines' plans for the lad. Like it pretty well here? he asked. No. Yes, uh, I don't know, was the answer. The delicacy and refinement of the boy's face, and the utter hopelessness of it, stirred his companion as he considered the one he had left in the tattered armchair. 
They walked on in silence until they had nearly reached the Little Island Cemetery. Then the boy's long lashes lifted. He seemed to be gazing at the shafts and headstones. Uncle Nick says the, the ghosts don't have far to walk, he remarked. The carpenter put his hand on Bert's shoulder. Stuff and nonsense, he said. You're too big a boy to believe that foolishness. The dark eyes regarded him. That's what Mrs. Lowell says. She says God takes care of us. The carpenter nodded. That's right, he returned emphatically. I hope he's got his eye on you right now and will see you through. You try to Mrs. Lowell and you believe what she says. Uncle Nick doesn't want me to. He says I'm... I'm better off alone. You're the best judge of that, I should say, remarked Matt bluntly. We're all entitled to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. I hope you'll get them, kid. Stand up for yourself. Do you like Mrs. Lowell? I... I don't know. It isn't any use for me to... to like her. Uncle Nick doesn't. They began to pass hedges of wild roses. She likes... likes flowers, added the boy. Take her some. That's right, take her some, said Blake, stopping and going to the side of the road. You won't tell Uncle Nick, said Bert anxiously. No, blast him, I won't tell him. Here, I've got a knife. They know how to defend themselves all right, don't they? Bert gathered some of the flowers. Amazingly large and deep of color they were, and Matt cut more, and a charming bunch was in the boy's hand at last. Blake noted that the sight of it brought color into the pale face. "'This must be another secret,' said Bert. "'Mrs. Lowell and I have some already.' They plodded on again. "'That's right,' said Blake. "'Hold them tight. That Mrs. Lowell and Miss Wilbur are friends worth having, I'm thinking.' The man frowned at his own thoughts. The creed of the island had, as its first article, mind your own business. Matt wished he could go to Mrs. Lowell and pour out to her all he had learned this afternoon, but, had his pledged word not prevented, his own habit and training would have made it difficult. When they reached the field which divided the road from the inn, Blake parted from the boy, who started off for home with his prize. He stumbled over the knolls while looking at the blossoms and inhaling their delicious fragrance. When he had nearly reached the house, he met the quartet of croquet players, the girls escorting the men to the road. Veronica and Barney Kelly came first, and Diana and Philip followed. "'Oh, how lovely, Bertie!' exclaimed Veronica, stopping and stooping the five sun-kisses to smell deep of the roses. "'They're not... they are not for you,' said the boy hastily. "'You've no taste, then,' said Kelly, while Veronica laughed. Have you a better girl than this one? Bertie pushed on in nervous haste, and Diana's smile did not detain him. Not for you either, apparently, remarked Philip. No, said Veronica. I'm good. Miss Wilbur is better, but his best girl is at home on the porch. There the boy found her, and luckily alone. He advanced, holding out his gift without a word. She colored with pleasure as she accepted it, holding it in one hand and caressing it with the other, as from time to time she took the sweet breath of the roses. "'Thank you so much, Bertie,' she exclaimed. "'It must have taken you a long time to gather so many.' "'No. He had a knife.' "'Who? Your uncle?' "'No. Mr. Blake. Uncle Nick mustn't know. You won't tell him.' "'No, dear child.' I won't tell him. She looked in the boy's face for a reflection of her own pleasure, but there was none. He remained standing. Sit down, Bertie. You've had a long walk. He did so with some reluctance. This is the last, last time I'll sit with you, he said. Are you going away? she asked, much concerned. 
No, but... But Uncle Nick doesn't... doesn't want me to speak to you. And... you make me sad. How do I make you sad, Bertie? Talking about... about things, he said vaguely. If I don't think and don't talk, then... then it's better. Uncle Nick says so, and... and I... It is so. Very well, Bertie, returned Mrs. Lowell quietly. All I want is what is best for you. He looked at her sweet face with the affection in the eyes. She was wearing a white dress, and the blossoms were a roseate glow against it. He struggled against all that he blindly felt she represented, all he had lost— all that would have kept the present and future from being blank. His face suffused with color, his eyes with tears. "'I can't bear it!' he said suddenly, with more force than she had supposed was in him, and rising with an energy of movement that sent his chair over with a crash, he fled into the house. Mrs. Lowell bent her head over the flowers for minutes, and, when she raised it, there was dew upon them. She looked off for a moment in thought, then rose, went into the house and upstairs to the gain room. The door was ajar. She could hear the boy sobbing. Entering, she saw him stretched on his cot, and she approached, drawing a chair beside it. Seating herself, she put a hand on his tightly doubled arm and looked at the averted dark head, its face buried in the pillow. She spoke to him quietly. "'Bertie, I am going to do just as you plan, and not ask you to go about with me any more. But I want you to remember all the time that I love you, and am thinking of you, and knowing that better times are coming for you. No human being can have as much power over us as God has. He isn't going to forget his own children whom he has created.' So the more you think about him, knowing that he is all-powerful and all-loving, the sooner you will feel his help coming to you. We don't know just how or when, but be sure it will come if you won't listen to discouragement. Discouragement is like a cloud that hides the sun, and God is the sun of the whole universe. You are trying to hide away from him when you weep, and let thoughts of grief and despair come in. Her voice carried through the nervous, dry sobs, and they lessened as she talked. When she finished, the dark head lay still on the pillow. She patted the thin arm. Now I will leave you, Bertie, she went on. Try to think about the shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Say that over and over to yourself, and know that it is true. Some day all these things will melt away. Think about it, and be hopeful, dear child. Remember I am in the house when you want me, and remember that I love to help you. Goodbye, dear. She stooped over the averted face and kissed the boy's temple. Then she passed out and down the stairs, the answer to Diana's telegram came from her mother, and read as follows. Your father away on the yacht. Be cautious socially. No luring relatives or friends in this country. Letter follows. The letter did follow, with great promptness. It was the old story of the worried hen who had hatched a duck. My dear child, you say you are feeling very well again— sleeping soundly and eating with good appetite. Then do come home at once. I have submitted to your wild goose chase because the doctor approved, and it was evidently working well. But I haven't really had an easy minute since you left. When you said that even taking a maid with you would make you nervous, and I allowed you to go off on a strange island quite alone, I put a great constraint upon myself." Your wire shows me that you are encountering some of the circumstances which I feared, and which will lead to future embarrassment. 
some people are evidently trying to claim acquaintance or even relationship with our family i wired you that there were no lorings connected with us in this country it was an odd coincidence that just after i sent the message to you i picked up a newspaper and saw that herbert loring had returned from paris and was staying at the copley plaza i am quite certain he has not immigrated to your island so my message is true enough he is a distant cousin of your father's and though not an old man he is a very broken one owing to family troubles seeing his name in the paper brought up sad memories and made me thankful for a good conscientious daughter who will always remember what is due her family and now when you are thrown among ordinary people such as you have never come in contact with is a good time to speak of such a tragedy mr loring's only child was a daughter a pretty artistic girl of whom he was inordinately proud and fond she became infatuated with a man whom her father forbade her even to see she eloped with him oh the agony she caused that father who had lost his wife years before of course he did the only thing possible in such a case forbade her name to be mentioned he became very ill and as soon as he was convalescent gave up business and went abroad he has spent all the years since about fifteen i think in travelling about trying to recover his health and divert his mind now the poor weary man has come back again i'm wondering if he will open his house he is wealthy and if his health is restored he may do so and take up life again i am sure your father will wish to communicate with mr loring as soon as he returns from his cruise perhaps the lonely man will accept an invitation to visit us i think it a grave question whether the artistic temperament does not furnish more sorrow than joy to the world i am proud and thankful that i have a daughter to whom an infatuation would be an impossibility come back diana if you feel strong enough i promise to preserve you from gaiety if you wish me to do so i do not feel at all easy about you please write and set a date for coming explaining also all that lay behind your wire your affectionate mother by the time diana finished reading this letter her hands were trembling she hurried to mrs lowell's room a rather stifled voice bade her enter her friend was stooping over the washstand bathing her eyes her face as she looked up through the splashing showed an april smile i knew it was you she said i recognized the step and i knew you wouldn't mind discovering that i cry once in a while my dear mrs lowell i'm sorry for whatever distresses you oh it's just that dear talented wretched boy i couldn't help weeping a few little weeps but what happy thing has happened to you my dear she added catching the excitement in the girl's face she dried her own finally and came forward and diana put the letter into her hands they both stood in silence until mrs lowell had finished reading and looked up her cheeks were as flushed as diana's and they exchanged a radiant gaze and then sat down One always weeps too soon said mrs lowell at last i was thinking said diana looking off that it might be a good plan for me to go to mr loring myself you good girl do you know him not at all but any one can go to the copley plaza and i can tell him i am his cousin you precious child when had you thought of going immediately said diana with recovered serenity shall i go to boston with you it will not be necessary i think but your mother would prefer it i am sure yes i see that i should go added mrs lowell casting a glance at the rich stationery in her hand with its heading idlewild newport rhode island she could feel the probable disapproval of this move which mrs woolber would feel nicholas gain did not come back to the inn to supper that afternoon Bertie came to the table expecting his uncle would be there and not daring to absent himself 
but he showed the effect of his unwanted outburst in such extra pallor and lassitude that Veronica was moved to give him her choicest offerings. Mrs. Lowell thought it best for his calm not to take any notice of him, but she and Diana found it difficult to control the excitement that beset their hearts as they looked at him. The drooping bird in the cage of a cruel and neglectful master, the key that would unlock its door almost in their hands. The next morning they took the early boat from the island, leaving word that they were going to Boston for a few days. Miss Burridge gave them their coffee and toast and bade them Godspeed, little reckoning how appropriate was the prayer for them. End of chapter 11《Chapter Twelve of the Keynote by Clara Louise Burnham. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Christy Luther. Chapter Twelve Cousin Herbert. Arrived at the hotel in Boston, an inquiry for Herbert Loring revealed that he was still there, but indisposed and not seeing visitors. In the suite Diana engaged, the two friends discussed ways and means, and it was decided that Diana should write a note to the invalid, and make herself known. "'My dear Mr. Loring,' she wrote, "'I might perhaps call you Cousin Herbert, for I believe my father, Charles Wilbur, claims relationship, and, if you grant me permission, I certainly shall do so.' I believe you and my father had time to see something of one another, before Steele swallowed him up and you became absorbed in railroads. My mother is at our cottage in Newport, and is wondering whether you could be induced to visit us when father returns from a cruise he is taking. I am here in the hotel for a short time, and would like very much to call on you, if there is some half-hour when you would feel like seeing a relative even though you could not grant a similar privilege to an outsider. I shall be so glad if you can allow me to make your acquaintance. It would be a satisfaction to my parents to hear from you by word of mouth. My mother saw by the papers that you were back in this country, and she wrote me of it. I have been on the islands in Casco Bay, where one gets very near nature's heart, the best thing that can happen to a tired schoolgirl. Kindly let me hear from you, and I shall be grateful if you will see me. After all, though we are strangers, blood is thicker than water. Yours cordially, Diana Wilbur. This is most extraordinary. Upon my word, it is most extraordinary, was Herbert Loring's comment when he had read this communication. His words might have been addressed to the thin air, or to Marlet, his man, and Marlet knew by experience that it was well not to appropriate them until he had received some further hint. So he stood at attention and looked with interest at the view from an opposite window. His employer was a haggard man, with a white moustache and grey hair. He was immaculately groomed and was seated in a reclining chair, his feet supported on the footrest. He wore a rich dressing-gown of grey silk. One noticed that his left arm was never raised, but with his right hand he now stroked his moustache. There were pouches under the eyes he lifted to his valet. "'Here is a schoolgirl in the hotel who wants to come to see me. Says she's my cousin.' I'm a nice figure to receive a schoolgirl. Marlet raised his eyebrows. You are certainly in shape to receive anybody, sir. But this young lady, may she be an impostor, sir? No, I think not. Marlet perceived that the note was an agreeable incident. She says she is the daughter of Wilbur, the Philadelphia steel man. It's odd that they should not have forgotten me. Begging your pardon, sir, 
I think if you were not so determined to deny yourself to friends, you would find that no one who had once known you would have forgotten. The sick man glanced back at the note in his lap. It escaped him on the slippery silk, and he made an involuntary effort with the useless arm to recover it. He frowned, and Marlet, stooping quickly, picked up the sheet and restored it. The invalid read the letter once again. "'Send word to this young lady that I will see her at three-thirty to-day,' he said at last. With much rejoicing, Diana, when she had received this word, arrayed herself for the call. She wore a thin grey gown with a rose at the girdle, and Mrs. Lowell, regarding her with admiration, thought no one could be better equipped externally to win the fastidious masculine heart. Herbert Loring thought so, too, when at the appointed hour she entered his room, and he received a swift impression of her fine quality. "'Welcome, my little cousin,' he said as he met her eyes, and the serene and charming smile irradiating her youthful beauty. "'I am a useless hulk. Can't get out of this chair without help. So you will pardon me.' She put her hand in the one he offered, and Marlet placed a chair beside him in such fashion that she faced him. "'That makes it the more gracious of you to receive me,' she replied. "'I should never have known what I missed had I refused,' he said gallantly. "'My friend Wilbur has a very beautiful daughter.' Marlet disappeared into the next room, and Diana blushed. "'Even in spite of sunburn,' she said. "'I was really touched, Cousin Diana, that your parents should remember me sufficiently for you to take the trouble to come to see me. It is a long time since anything has pleased me so much. I have been such a rover that I am a stranger in my own land. Diana had not expected to feel guilty of false pretenses, but this speech accused her, even while it lent her increased courage, since his was a heart that could be touched. "'I hope you will visit us,' she said after I return to Newport. "'Are you on your way there now?' "'No, not quite yet. It is difficult to tear oneself away from Casco Bay after one once falls under the spell.' Loring nodded. "'I know the environment. Very piney and fresh and all that. Cold water, though. Very cold.' "'Yes, but we all take dips in it. Youth, said the sick man, shaking his head. Youth. If one does not swim, I know it is quite too cold, said Diana. I am glad you are familiar with that country, for then you can sympathize with my enthusiasm. I long to have a place there of my own, and perhaps with such congruity of taste— you and I together can persuade my parents that it would not be too erratic in me to buy a part of that green hill and be there a little while every year. The invalid nodded. I'll say amen to anything you indicate, he returned readily. How devoutly Diana hoped this promise might be kept. I have... "'Another reason for being glad to meet a man relative just now,' she went on. "'There are some people at the inn where I am staying who present such a strange problem. "'When injustice is obviously being done, one longs to help.' "'Her companion nodded. "'That is natural, but usually futile,' he said. It is a very good rule to keep off the grass. Yes, but this affair makes me very unhappy, Cousin Herbert. A shame, he returned, and would like to have patted her pretty hand, but she was on his left side. Too bad there is always some serpent in paradise. 
don't be too tender-hearted my dear don't be too tender-hearted it doesn't pay of course wherever you go people will try to lay you under tribute you must learn to wear an armor a full suit of chain armor under your dainty costumes this is not a question of money said diana her heart beating faster and for the first time she quaked at the full realization of her errand would you let me tell you about it cousin herbert why of course my child if it is any satisfaction to you to confide in such a useless old cripple as i have become you are far from that returned the girl steadying the voice which threatened to waver your opinion on the subject will be very valuable to me the sick man lifted his heavy eyebrows and smoothed his moustache then proceed by all means he said one thing i have in tragic abundance is time and i am flattered there is a man at our inn began diana her fingers tightly intertwined in her lap who has a young boy in his power the lad is his nephew he shows every sign of years of neglect the uncle continually betrays himself and scarcely tries to hide the fact that he is looking forward to incarcerating the boy in some institution for the deranged simply to get rid of him no there is money back in the family somewhere and we i have come to the conviction that this man believes the boy will fall heir to it and that if he is safely out of the way the uncle as guardian will get control of this money what sort of mentality does the boy seem to have he is a sensitive fine-grained lad with just the sort of nature which persistent brutality will blight and paralyze he has been so neglected that he has little physical resistance and one can see him being gradually crushed with as little hope of escape as the fly in the spider's web and you take it greatly to heart eh said the invalid regarding the girl's flushed face and appealing eyes wouldn't any one she asked a confounded nuisance to have such a circumstance mar your vacation oh think of the boy's side of it cousin herbert you want my opinion i think the law could take a hand there yes but the law is so slow diana swallowed so near a relative as an uncle own brother to the boy's father can put up a hypocritical fight and establish a very strong claim herbert loring shook his head my dear child in your position if you begin on this quixotic business there will be no end to it believe me you can't right all the wrongs in the world and you will have the pack in full cry after you if it is known that you have let down the bars you can state this case to a lawyer and put it in his hands with the understanding that you will pay the bills but your identity must be kept secret then let them fight it out you can't do any more than that a pity i didn't know you were here this morning my lawyer was with me the speaker's tired eyes smiled and the corners of his moustache lifted slightly i have celebrated my return by destroying my will and the new business was to have been finished this morning but i was uncertain about some matters that the lawyer is looking up today he'll come tomorrow morning to draw up the new will and before he goes i will send for you and you shall tell him about your boy and his ogre of an uncle diana's heart was beating fast now she summoned all her courage what is so exciting to me cousin herbert she began and 
he wondered to hear the wavering in her voice, is that lately I have learned that this lad is related to someone rich and powerful who could rescue him at once. A puzzled frown came in Loring's forehead. Anyone I know? he asked. Surely, or I should not trouble you at a time when you are not feeling strong. Cousin Herbert, this neglected boy belongs to you. He is your grandson. Diana unconsciously stretched her clasped hands toward him. A strange white change came over her listener's face, and the expression that awoke in the eyes that met hers was terrible to her. "'This is the explanation of your desire to make my acquaintance,' he said in a changed voice. She was so frightened that she seemed to hear her own heartbeats. "'The boy's name is Gain, Herbert Loring Gain,' she went on desperately. "'Miss Wilbur, you have ventured in where angels would fear to tread,' said the sick man sternly. "'But you awake no memory. That room where you intrude is bare and empty. You—' "'He is talented,' pleaded Diana. "'Very talented, as an artist. Any family might be proud to own him and bring him out of a cellar into the sunshine.' think of the interest in life it would give you think it over cousin herbert just be willing to see him once while she was talking her companion touched the bell on the table beside him and the words died on her lips as the valet came into the room i am tired marlet said the invalid huskily miss wilbur is ready to go his head fell back against a down pillow "'Pardon my not attending you to the door,' he added, ignoring the girl's wet-eyed confusion. She gathered herself together and rose. "'Thank you for allowing me to come in,' she said, inclining her head, and then she turned toward the door which Marlet held open. She continued to hold her head high until she reached her own apartment, where Mrs. Lowell was waiting. The latter started to her feet as she viewed her friend's entrance and noted her excited color and trembling lips. Diana succeeded in uttering one word. Hopeless! Then she succumbed into Mrs. Lowell's arms and fell into wild weeping on her shoulder. Led to a couch, she lay upon it and continued weeping while Mrs. Lowell sat beside her and held her hand comfortingly. We did right to come, however, she said, when, after a time, the girl was quiet. And you fulfilled your duty bravely in going to him. You cannot tell what fruit your visit may bring forth. Don't try to tell me about it now. He has suffered a terrible wound to his pride and heart, and even after many years it could smart when touched. We mustn't be discouraged. Our mission is a righteous one, and so God is on our side. And if we don't accomplish the child's deliverance in this way, we shall in some other way. I am going to read you one of the most inspired and inspiring poems ever written. And, taking up her Bible, Mrs. Lowell turned its pages and read aloud the 91st Psalm. At seven o'clock they had dinner served in their room, and Diana recounted her experience with the invalid before they retired for the night. Mrs. Lowell again talked to her calmly and comfortingly, and the girl's mortified pride and disappointed heart finally quieted, and she slept. The next morning the two friends discussed plans over the breakfast which was served in their room. When later the waiter arrived to carry away the tray, he was so full of news that he was obliged to speak. "'Big excitement in the house,' he said. "'Gentleman dead in his bed. Big man, too. Used to be president of a big railroad. Wouldn't wonder if the papers had extras out in a few minutes.' 
Diana caught Mrs. Lowell's hand, and the latter spoke to the man. "'What name?' "'Why, it's Herbert Loring. I guess that'll make some stir.' It certainly made some stir in Diana's heart. It was throbbing. When the waiter had left the room she lifted horrified eyes to her friend. "'Do you think I killed him?' she murmured. "'No, no, dear child.' "'I noticed he was paralyzed on one side,' said the girl. "'But the valet will tell them that I excited him so that he dismissed me. "'Shall I pay our bill and we go away at once?' "'Just as you like, dear.' "'I couldn't do that,' said Diana suddenly. "'I cannot be a coward.' "'Then let us stay right here,' said Mrs. Lowell quietly. "'You may be questioned, and it will be better to be found easily. "'I suppose there will have to be an inquest or some such formality.' "'Oh, this is dreadful!' exclaimed the girl. "'If my mother knew this, she would never allow me to escape from under her wing again. "'She has a horror of anything even unconventional.' "'Just be calm and strong in the right, Diana, and if any one comes to question you, try not to lose your self-control. I know you have a great deal. I shall stay beside you. Yes, I beg of you not to leave me. Poor Mr. Loring, poor Cousin Herbert, how much sorrow he must have had, so proud a man to become helpless.' Only five minutes later, two cards were presented at the door. One was that of a doctor, the other of a lawyer. Mrs. Lowell sent word that the men were to be admitted. Diana had on the peach-colored negligee, and when the two callers were ushered into the living room of her suite, they found a pale, large-eyed girl standing with their cards in her hand. End of chapter 12. Chapter 13 of The Keynote by Clara Louise Burnham. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Christy Lufer. Chapter 13 The Law. One of the cards which Diana held read, Ernst Felt, M.D. The other was that of Luther Wren, attorney at law. "'Be seated, gentlemen,' said Diana. "'I know the urgency of your errand, and therefore I would not detain you while I dressed. This is my friend, Mrs. Lowell. We were just finishing breakfast when the shocking news was brought to us. Mrs. Lowell, Dr. Velt, and Mr. Wren.' The portentous expression in the face of the two visitors did not lighten as they bowed and took possession of the chairs Diana indicated. Thrills of dread were coursing down her spine, and her knees were weak enough to cause her to be glad to be able to take her own seat. She felt a horrible uncertainty as to her own responsibility in the tragedy. The physician, as the most aggrieved party, spoke first. "'Mr. Loring was my patient,' he said, speaking with some accent. "'From what his valet tells us, you should be able to throw some light on what has occurred.' The speaker's frown darkened as he spoke. This wretched girl had robbed him. No one could tell of how much. "'Mr. Loring did not know you, had never seen you.' "'Let me question the young lady.' interrupted the lawyer. If this girl in the rich garments and the luxurious suite were an adventuress planning to get money from the sick man, she had staged herself well. She was beautiful, and her eyes were now large with horror, perhaps with guilt. How did you manage to get into Mr. Loring's apartment? I wrote him a note requesting him to see me, faltered Diana. He is, 
he is a sort of relation of mine it would be a little difficult to tell just what relation i dare say put in the doctor nodding odd that you couldn't let a sick man get a bit acclimated on his return before you forced yourself an utter stranger into his rooms wait a bit dr velt said the lawyer interrupting again let us have your full name please he added turning to the culprit diana wilbur said the girl did you not find the note i wrote mr loring no the valet followed his master's orders and destroyed the note as soon as you were gone marlet is completely unstrung he couldn't remember anything about your communication except that mr loring told him that he was about to have a visit from a schoolgirl marlet said that you finally left the room in tears and that his master collapsed and it looks like manslaughter that's what it looks like manslaughter said the doctor angrily diana's very lips grew pale oh gentlemen she said and her quiet voice trembled please be very careful what you say supposing anything about me should get into the papers yes dr velt said the lawyer quickly we should be careful in our accusations remember that mr loring has sustained two strokes before his return his interview with me yesterday morning was a draught upon him diana turned toward the lawyer and clasped her hands oh yes she said he told me he had destroyed his will aha said the doctor nodding his big gray head again we begin to see light his will that is what you are interested in eh a sort of relation eh gentlemen said mrs lowell suddenly taking part in the interview i think it might help you in your judgments to know that miss wilbur is the only child of charles wilbur the steel man of philadelphia her announcement had a dramatic effect the doctor's mouth opened mutely as he stared the lawyer's brow cleared and he looked curiously at diana and bowed you see said the girl unsteadily it would be dreadful if anything about me in connection with this shocking occurrence should get into the papers for i meant no harm mr loring was a distant connection of my father's and i went to him in behalf of some one else she hesitated can you tell why your visit should have so excited him asked the lawyer yes it was because i spoke of his daughter will you repeat to us just what you said to him i will tell you it is a matter for a lawyer miss wilbur said dr velt rising and speaking in a voice which he strove not to make too unlike his previous manner we cannot tell until the post-mortem takes place just what caused this death but i hope the result of the investigation may be enlightenment that will set your mind at rest since you wish to speak with mr wren i will leave you and hope that he will be able to assist you in your problem whatever it may be good morning and with what grace he could muster the physician left the room diana sank back in her chair and mrs lowell saw her exhaustion shall i tell our story to mr wren she asked the girl nodded miss wilbur has generously thrown herself into the thick of a problem which has been absorbing me in the last weeks she began and then she proceeded to tell the details of their experience the lawyer listened with close attention so on the impulse of the moment we came to boston arriving yesterday morning and miss wilbur's request to see mr loring was met by an appointment by him for three-thirty which she kept he was very gracious to me said diana and i was very hopeful at first she stopped to control the quivering of her lips how did you proceed 
asked the lawyer kindly. I told him the boy's story, and he advised me to keep out of that sort of entanglement in another's affairs. I was frightened then, but I continued because, of course, I could not relinquish the matter there, and, finally, I told him that the boy was his grandson. Diana's voice stopped again, and she shook her head. "'He became excited? He did?' asked the lawyer encouragingly. "'No. Cold. Stern. He—he he repulsed me, and utterly repudiated the whole matter. He said there was not even the—the the echo of a memory left.' Diana lifted her handkerchief to her eyes. "'Poor little Helen. I knew her well,' said the lawyer thoughtfully. "'You did know Bertie's mother,' said Mrs. Lowell with interest. "'Then you will be able to judge of a sketch a lonely little boy made of her. "'We had put this matter into the hands of Mrs. Lowell's husband, who is a lawyer in New York,' said Diana. We expected to have a long search for Bertie's grandfather, but, as Mrs. Lowell has told you, my mother all unconsciously gave us the information we needed, and then, oh, Mr. Wren, how could I do otherwise? And yet it is so dreadful to think. Again Diana covered her eyes. Don't think it, Miss Wilbur, said the lawyer decidedly. You did what was womanly and brave. Had you come to me, instead of going directly to Mr. Loring, it might possibly have been better. But how can we know? My client and old friend was immovably set against the daughter who defied him. And if the intense feeling which your plea roused in him was a boomerang that laid him low, that is not your fault, and couldn't possibly have been foreseen. Now, dismiss that fear from your thoughts. A condition has arisen which, perhaps, has not occurred to either of you ladies. From what you tell me, it looks as if the boy who has interested you may really be Herbert Loring's grandson. That will have to be proved, and doubtless the avaricious uncle has the proofs if they exist. That once accomplished— this lad will be sole heir to a considerable fortune, for there is no will. Mrs. Lowell and Diana exchanged a look. Mr. Wren, said Mrs. Lowell quickly, Mr. Gain is capable of any brutality. He will see Mr. Loring's death in the papers. But he does not know that there is no will, the lawyer reminded her, and he will probably come to me with proofs that the boy should inherit. That would naturally be his next step. Do you think the boy's mentality has been hopelessly impaired? I do not, said Mrs. Lowell, and her face grew radiant. When once the slave is freed, God will take care of Bertie's mentality. The lawyer bent his heavy brows upon her gravely. "'Young Herbert has a good friend in you,' he said. "'Oh, Mr. Wren,' exclaimed Diana fervently, "'if you can get Mrs. Lowell to supervise his life for the next five years, "'you will do the best thing that could be done for him in all the world.' "'The lawyer nodded, still with thoughtful eyes on Mrs. Lowell's speaking face. "'She was thanking God as she sat there.' that the crushing burden was being lifted from one of his little ones. "'Mr. Loring's funeral will be a rather sad and perfunctory ceremony,' said Mr. Wren. "'For several years he has absented himself from this country most of the time. He is not rich in even poor relations. I remember a few names which were mentioned in the will which was destroyed yesterday— and I am sure he would wish me to respect his wishes, and give moderate sums to those beneficiaries, for he stated that he should not change that clause. I wonder if you ladies might be willing to stay over for the funeral. 
I am certain that Mr. Gain will attend it and see me afterward. A compassion that swept through Diana at remembrance of the tired eyes and the helpless figure in its rich wrappings caused her to give her consent to remain for the funeral. She wired her mother that, being in Boston for a few days, she should attend that ceremony, and was disconcerted to receive a return message stating that her mother would also attend, her father not having returned from his cruise. She showed this to Mrs. Lowell, and the latter was privately amused at the consternation betrayed by the girl at the prospect of welcoming a parent. "'Of course it won't be necessary to trouble her with any details,' said Mrs. Lowell, and Diana pressed her hand in token that she appreciated the comfort of her perception. The first thought Mrs. Lowell had upon seeing Mrs. Wilbur was, "'What a handsome man Diana's father must be!' For the girl did not get her beauty from this plump little lady, with the short nose, wide mouth, and small eyes. Even Mrs. Wilbur's grand air, erect carriage, and perfect dress, could not make her a stately figure, although it was her habit to consider herself one, and her plump, little, jeweled hand wielded a lorgnette in a manner which entitled her to a Roman nose and impressive height. Her maid, Leonie, was with her, and looked after her mistress with what seemed to Mrs. Lowell an amazing knowledge of her needs and wishes. "'Look at your hands!' was Mrs. Wilbur's greeting of her daughter. "'I know you have not worn gloves.' Diana bent down to her in all meekness. "'Not continuously, Mama," she said. "'They will very soon blanch again.' "'You're coming right home with me after this sad, sad affair, of course,' continued Mrs. Wilbur. "'How strange that you happen to be in Boston! And fortunate, too! Your father would have liked us to show this attention.' By this time they were in Mrs. Wilbur's suite in the hotel, and she turned to Mrs. Lowell. "'I am grateful to you for taking care of this child of mine,' she said. "'I don't like to tell her how well she looks, for it encourages her in such a prank as this island summer. It has proved a good plan for her, I'm sure, responded Mrs. Lowell. But enough is enough, said Mrs. Wilbur. She is rested now, and our friends are always asking for her. No more island. Dear Mama, do not be so determined, for Mrs. Lowell and I just came here for a few days— and I shall have to return and gather my belongings together at least. Very well, then I will go with you and look at it myself. Mrs. Lowell could with difficulty repress a smile at the way Diana's eyes enlarged with apprehension. You would not like it, dear, you would not like it, she said earnestly. Then why do you— "'responded her mother defiantly. "'Because I like roughing it. "'I like camping.' "'Well,' sighed Mrs. Wilbur, "'I am so near. "'I may as well look at it.' "'What would you do in a house without a bathroom?' "'asked Diana. "'The blank, incredulous look "'with which Mrs. Wilbur met her daughter's question— made Mrs. Lowell expect her parted lips to utter, "'There ain't no such animal.' But the lady merely said reproachfully, "'How can you like it there, Diana?' "'My ancestors had no bathtubs,' replied the girl. "'Then, besides, we have the ocean.' "'Well,' sighed Mrs. Wilbur, the funeral comes first. I suppose Mr. Loring was confined to his room, so you couldn't happen to see him about the hotel? Diana cast a glance at Mrs. Lowell before she replied. I did see him, though, Mama. The girl felt very certain that the episode could never be finished without this fact transpiring. You did? Mrs. Wilbur sat up with great interest. 
that explains why you seem to me a little sad ever since i came you saw the poor man how did it happen i wrote him a note and asked him if i could call i reminded him that we were related she hesitated why diana wilbur i have never heard of anything so extraordinary you dear lamb how pleased your father will be mrs lowell she turned to that lady do you wonder i'm proud of this child do you believe that one young girl in a thousand would take the trouble to pay such an attention to an elderly relative whom she had never seen mrs lowell was saved from the embarrassment of replying for diana spoke hurriedly it isn't what you think mamma i went to him on an errand as someone else's errand mrs wilbur put up her lorgnette the better to view her daughter's crimsoning cheeks and quivering lips tell me what it was at once she commanded who dared make use of you in such a way no one protested the girl it was my own idea but please don't ask me to tell you of it now i have had such a shock i am really not able to talk about it yet very well then i will wait mrs wilbur's dilated nostrils expressed her displeasure but this proves that you are just as i have felt too young to be wandering about on your own i should not have allowed you to leave me as she finished the mother swept mrs lowell with a condemning glance in which she withdrew all her previous approval of that lady mrs lowell understood it but she spoke pleasantly when the right time comes for you to learn what brought us to boston you will find that your daughter deserves only approval she said in her quiet cheerful manner mrs wilbur's nostrils still dilated and she used her fan in a majestic silence End of chapter 13chapter 14 of the keynote by clara louise burnham this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by christy loofer chapter 14 the will herbert loring's funeral was conducted in the church to which he had been a contributor for many years distant connections of the family old business friends and curiosity seekers made a gathering of average size and among those seated toward the back of the audience was nicholas gain the astute lawyer's expectation of a visit from him was not disappointed indeed luther wren came to his office at an earlier hour than usual the following morning entirely in honor of that gentleman on the drive to the cemetery the day of the funeral mr wren had placed diana her mother and mrs lowell in the motor with himself there was little said on the way out the lawyer was well known by reputation to mrs wilbur and the only drawback to her satisfaction in the arrangement was diana's preoccupation and the knowledge that interesting information was being kept back from her mrs wilbur had not only sent lavish gifts of flowers to the church but there seeming to be no one but paid workers to attend to the decorations she had personally supervised them and coming back from the cemetery the lawyer expressed his appreciation of her kindness and her presence in a manner to apply much balm however he turned directly from his respectful laudation of mrs wilbur to her daughter how long can you and mrs lowell stay on he asked and the mother became alert his manner signified previous acquaintance with diana just as long as is necessary was the girl's surprising reply i am certain that gain will call on me the first thing to-morrow morning and i should like you to remain near the telephone if you will certainly replied diana mr wren 
"'I don't understand what you are asking of my daughter,' said Mrs. Wilbur crisply. "'Ah!' the lawyer bowed gravely. "'Perhaps you have not been told of the surprising turn events have taken. It is a matter which requires secrecy until identities are established and evildoers circumvented. Let me congratulate you, Mrs. Wilbur, on a remarkably fine and intelligent daughter. She is a credit to your bringing up. Not many mothers can boast of having instilled such prudence.' The lady leaned back in her corner, not certain whether to accept this disarming or to insist immediately upon her rights. She decided to compromise and wait until they reached the hotel. "'My daughter tells you she can wait in Boston as long as is necessary,' she said at last, "'and her mother will have to understand the necessity.' "'Certainly, Mrs. Wilbur,' responded the lawyer, we have found ourselves in a totally unexpected situation. Mr. Herbert Loring destroyed his will and died before he could make another. Mrs. Wilbur exclaimed. Mr. Loring was known to be wealthy, and she was interested in fortunes. Her brain began working actively on the probabilities of heirs. The next strange event is that your young daughter— has probably found the air. Mrs. Wilbur raised her lorgnette and regarded Diana, drooping opposite, as if she were a new discovery. "'I wish to understand,' she said with dignity. "'It seems that Mr. Loring's disobedient daughter left a son, whose existence has been unsuspected, unless Mr. Loring himself knew of it which he never betrayed. Your daughter and Mrs. Lowell have found the boy. Not I, protested Diana. Mrs. Lowell, in her sweet unselfishness, deserves all the credit. I should have paid no attention to him, but I— It was through your letter, Mama, that I found the boy's grandfather. We all had a hand in it, then, it seems— said Mrs. Wilbur. "'The boy's uncle has possession of him. His father and mother are both dead, and according to these ladies, the uncle can qualify as the world's meanest man. So we proceed carefully until the proofs which he is supposed to have are in hand. You, Mrs. Wilbur, will aid us in silence on the subject until the right time for speaking.' "'How old is he, Diana? burst forth the lady. What does he look like? Is he clever and worthy of such a heritage? He is a poor, shabby, ill-treated boy, about fourteen years old. He has never had a chance. But I scarcely know him. Mrs. Lowell is the one who discovered him and cared for him. Mrs. Wilbur glanced at Mrs. Lowell, but she could not bring herself to ask her a question. She felt a vague jealousy and sense of injury at finding this stranger in her child's confidence, and aiding and abetting her in so much independence of action. As soon as possible after the reception of Mrs. Wilbur's enlightening letter at the island, Mrs. Lowell had wired her husband that the search was ended before it had begun, and he returned Diana's check with congratulations. "'What an amazed boy that will be, Mr. Wren,' remarked Mrs. Wilbur. "'What's his name?' "'Herbert Loring Gain. Hm. I suppose his mother had all sorts of hope that with a son of that name she could placate her father.' "'Doubtless she did,' replied the lawyer. "'And I wish it might have proved so.' Perhaps they would both have been alive today, had she succeeded. But my old friend Loring never mentioned her to me, and I don't know what efforts she made. There must be a good deal of delay before the young heir can come into his own. I suppose so, sighed Mrs. Wilbur. That tiresome law moves slowly. Diana looked up with sudden attention. "'But we must not be dilatory in rescuing the boy.' 
Mr. Wren nodded. If he is proved to be the right one. There can be no doubt of it, said Mrs. Lowell. Not to charming, sympathetic ladies, of course, returned the lawyer with a smile. I feel that every day counts, said Mrs. Lowell. He must be removed from that mental malaria as soon as possible. I will, began Diana, and then she glanced at her mother. I mean, Mama will gladly finance him, I'm sure, for the present. Perhaps, said Mrs. Wilbur with dignity, when you see fit to tell me the whole story, I'm sure I haven't had it yet. "'There is no reason to burden you, Mama, with disagreeable considerations,' said Diana meekly. "'I can myself look after the boy's needs.' "'Yes, she can,' said Mrs. Wilbur, in an offended tone. "'What do you think, Mr. Wren, of a father who insists on giving a young girl an unlimited cheque-book, not requiring her to give any account of what she does with money?' The lawyer smiled at the embarrassed culprit. "'I think that your husband has proved himself a very good reader of character all through his career.' Mrs. Wilbur bounced back into her corner. She didn't intend to bounce. She intended to lean back gracefully, with an air of renouncing all interest in this matter which had proceeded so far without her cooperation. But— just at that moment the car went over a thank you, ma'am. As has already been said, Luther Wren, the following morning, sought his office at an earlier hour than was customary, and Nicholas Gain was there before him. He did not keep him waiting long, and the stocky figure and dark face soon appeared in the private office. The lawyer regarded the stranger over his eyeglasses. "'I didn't have any card,' said the visitor. "'My name is Gain, Nicholas Gain.' "'Be seated, sir. What is your errand?' "'I would like to be present at the reading of the Herbert Loring will.' The speaker's manner was confident, and he seemed endeavouring to repress excitement. "'Indeed. Are you a relative?' "'No, but my nephew is.' I have a great surprise for you, Mr. Wren. My nephew is Herbert Loring's grandson and namesake. Nicholas Gain marveled at the self-control of a lawyer, for Luther Wren's expression did not change. I visited Mr. Loring before he went abroad the last time, but he would not listen to me or look at my proofs. So... I suppose he has not mentioned his grandson in his will. And, if that is the fact, I wish to retain you to break the will. This declaration was made with great energy and a flash of the speaker's dark eyes. You have proofs, then? said Mr. Wren, after a short hesitation, perhaps to make sure of the retention of that self-control. Yes. Right here. Gain caught up from the floor a small black leather bag and opened it. Here are the letters. Bert's mother wrote her father to try for reconciliation. Returned unopened, you see. Here's her picture. Perhaps you knew her. Luther Wren took the small card photograph and gazed at it long. My brother was an irresponsible sort of chap. At the time he met Miss Loring, he'd put through a good deal and was riding on top of the wave. She was artistic in her tastes, and he met her through the artist set at Gloucester, where she was that summer. And she took a fancy to him that her father couldn't break off. Unfortunate, you'll say, but Lambert was a stunning-looking chap, and she decided firmly on her course. So, now, here's this boy, and the law should protect his rights. Here's the record of his birth, fourteen years ago, in her own writing. Perhaps you know her writing. Gain was talking fast and excitedly, and Wren took from his hand one after another of the proofs he offered and 
laid them on his desk with no change of countenance. "'What sort of a boy is your nephew?' he asked. "'A bright boy?' Gaines' face changed. He looked away. "'Well, no, I can't say he is. Bert is delicate. He needs all sorts of care. Care that takes heaps of money to pay for. I haven't been able to do for him what I'd like to. As soon as you get his money for him, I shall engage professional care, and see that he has the best. I'm a good businessman, if I do say it, and I'll see that his funds multiply until he's able to look after his fortune himself. Luther Wren nodded. I see, he said, and he did, very plainly. Now, there will be no reading of the will, Mr. Gain. That is all attended to. So you may leave this matter with me. Was the boy mentioned? asked Gain eagerly. No, no mention of him. You think you can get some money, though, don't you? Possibly. I'll see you again. There ain't any kind of doubt that he's the genuine grandson, said Gain, rising reluctantly as the lawyer got to his feet. Your proofs seem to be convincing, was the grave reply. Well, could you, couldn't you advance me something now for Bert's care? He needs a lot of things, that boy does. You go too swiftly, Mr. Gain. Come back here at three o'clock, day after tomorrow. Gain looked at the papers and picture strewn on the lawyer's desk. I don't know about leaving the only proofs of our rights that I've got. Luther Wren turned to the desk and gathered them up. Certainly. Take them to some lawyer in whom you have confidence. Ha! Oh, Shaw, sure, no, said Gain sheepishly. I didn't mean that. You were Mr. Loring's lawyer. You're the one to handle the case. Good day, then, Mr. Gain. Good day and Nicholas took his departure. As soon as the door had closed behind him, Wren seated himself at the desk and called up the Copley Plaza. Diana was waiting. "'Miss Wilbur?' "'Yes?' "'Mr. Wren speaking. Mr. Gain has been here. Please wire at once to the island, and get someone to bring the boy to your hotel as soon as possible.' "'Yes, Mr. Wren.' "'I think Mr. Barrison is the one to ask,' said Diana to Mrs. Lowell, who was waiting near. So it was that an hour later Philip Barrison was called to the telephone at the island store to receive a telegram. "'I know what it is,' exclaimed Barney Kelly. "'All Saints is going to outbid the Apostles for you. You're the rising young beggar.' He wandered down with Philip to the store and loitered about outside, talking to Matt Blake. When Philip reappeared, it was with a hurried air. "'Want anything in Boston?' he asked. "'Of course we do. The Brahms. But what's up?' "'I've got to go. Wire for Miss Wilbur.' "'Aha!' said Kelly, following Philip's long strides to the express wagon which Blake was just mounting. "'No, no, no,' returned Philip. Not personal. No such luck. Hello, Matt. Going up along? Eh, hey, yes. See you later, Kelly. I have to go up to Miss Burge's. And Philip jumped into the seat beside the driver. Oh, you guessed wrong. You're going to see me right along, returned Barney, hopping up on the tail of the wagon and letting his feet hang over while he whistled cheerily. End of chapter 14 Chapter 15 of the Keynote by Clara Louise Burnham. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Christy Lufer. Chapter 15 A Sudden Journey. I have to get the afternoon boat, Matt, explained Philip. Miss Wilbur wants me to bring the game boy to Boston in a hurry. Blake looked around alertly as his horse pulled slowly up the hill to the road. "'Miss Wilbur,' 
he repeated. "'Why didn't his uncle send for him? He's there.' "'Is he?' asked Philip carelessly. "'I didn't know the island had been deprived of his artistic presence.' "'Yes, you bet he lit out when he saw by the paper that the millionaire he's had his eye on was dead.' Blake shook his head. "'There must be something doing, or Miss Wilbur wouldn't be sending for the kid.' "'Oh, you know she and Mrs. Lowell made a protégé of him. "'My idea is they want to give him some kind of a treat. "'But I must say I'm surprised at the importance she seems to have put on my bringing him. "'Dead or alive, as you might say. "'She says if he holds back, through fear of his uncle's displeasure, "'to tell the boy his uncle is there. "'Oh, yes, he's there, believe me. "'Keep it under your hat.' "'But that old souse has got it all fixed "'that the boy is grandson of that Herbert Loring "'who has just died, "'and he's going to get a slice of the money. "'Now, you might as well know, Phil, "'as long as you're doing the errand, "'that Gaines a skunk. "'He's counting on shutting that boy up "'and getting the money himself. "'He told me so one time when he was half seas over. "'Believe me, I feel sorry for that kid.' If he ever had any spirit, he's had it squeezed out of him. By George, I'd like to have those ladies know Gaines' plans. They certainly must be greatly interested in the boy to take all this trouble, said Philip. I knew they were very much stirred up over Gaines' treatment of Bert, but I don't know whether they're aware of how far he intends to carry it. I'm glad you've told me this. I... Fancy we shall find that their plan is to give the boy a show or two and some ice cream instead of a fortune. Bert Gain, Herbert Loring's heir, scoffed Philip. Don't make me laugh. My lips cracked. Ever, I'll oblige those two corking women and bring him to them, by the scruff of the neck if necessary. Ever see the Copley Plaza, Matt? If you did, you can make a picture of me making a grand entrance there with Bert. "'I do feel sorry for that kid,' repeated Blake with feeling. "'So do I. And after what you say, I'm wondering why Gain is keeping himself in the background and letting the goddess Diana take charge.' "'I wish her luck,' said Matt emphatically. "'I wish her luck.' Arrived where the road branches away to the inn, Philip and his friend left the wagon and struck off through the field. Halfway across they met Miss Emerson, walking triumphantly between Mr. Pratt and Mr. Evans, a parasol over her shoulder. It is not well to sun soft ripples of hair when the head that grew them is far across the seas. "'Good morning,' she cried gaily. "'We're going to the post office. Can we do anything for you?' "'Thank you,' said Barney. "'We've just come from there. "'You might write me a letter or two, Miss Emerson, while you're waiting. "'I've been neglected since I've been here.' "'I shall be delighted,' she returned, "'regarding his tanned face and permanent wave with high approval. "'I love to write. "'I even like pencil and paper games, "'Verbarium and Crambo and all those. "'I've been trying to convert these men.' I wish you would both come up and spend the evening and let me show you how much fun it is. There was a wild look in the grave faces of her escorts which advised caution. You're always so kind, Miss Emerson, said Kelly. Shall we see you at dinner? she asked. Depends on how good your eyes are, said Philip pleasantly. We dine at home, and then I'm off for Boston. Really? "'How can you bear to leave here?' Miss Emerson waved her parasol as the young men nodded and passed on. "'I think that Mr. Kelly is perfectly delightful,' she said as they pursued their way. "'So full of fun, always.' Then she proceeded to tell her captives how many words could be made from the one C-A-R-P-E-T. Philip and Barney walked around to the front of the inn, and there were Veronica and the unconscious young Herbert, leaning over the sweet-pea bed. 
Veronica was using the trowel, and the boy was weeding. He glanced up under his lashes, then went on with his work. Veronica rose and welcomed the arrivals. "'You see, Aunt Priscilla keeps us at it, Mr. Barrison. She isn't going to have your garden neglected. And just look at the buds.' "'Fine. In another week there'll be a show.' "'And the smell,' said Barney fervently. "'I adore them.' "'You look rather sweet peeish yourself, Miss Veronica,' he added, regarding her gingham gown of fine pink and white checks. "'Do you know you're going to have me on your hands the next few days?' "'What's going to happen?' asked Veronica. "'There's going to be a dance at the hall tonight,' suggested Barney. "'I know it,' returned Veronica. "'Can you dance?' Barney looked at her reproachfully. "'It's a land sport. How can you ask? A duck can swim, and Kelly can dance. Will you take me? I'm shy.' "'If Mr. Barrison will allow it,' said Veronica, with a demure glance at Philip. "'Not a word to Papa, I promise,' he said. "'What a pity Miss Diana isn't here!' she exclaimed. "'I shall see her to-morrow,' returned Philip. "'You going to Boston?' "'Mm-hmm.' "'That's what I'm telling you,' said Kelly. "'You mustn't allow me to get lonely. "'We'll row in the cove.' "'Really? Go near the water?' replied Veronica, laughing incredulously. "'Yes. Aunt Maria is stuffing me like a Thanksgiving turkey. No tennis. I just naturally had to get a boat. Without a motor, be it well understood.' "'That's fun,' said Veronica, her eyes shining. She hoped Philip would stay away indefinitely. If Mr. Kelly could really dance. Meanwhile, Philip had stood watching the boy's slender hands pulling out weeds. "'Aren't you going to speak to me, Bert?' "'I—' "'Yes. How do you do?' The lad was so used to being overlooked by everybody except Mrs. Lowell and Diana that Philip's question surprised him, and he rose and looked at him. "'Do you miss Mrs. Lowell and Miss Wilbur?' asked Philip. Yes. His uncle is gone, too, said Veronica. We've had some good times all alone, haven't we, Bert? He's learning to play croquet, and he helps me with the garden. The boy regarded her in silence and with no change of expression. Philip thought, or imagined, that in his dull, undeveloped way he resented the girl's kindly tone of patronage. He caught the lad's eye again. "'I'm going to see Mrs. Lowell and Miss Wilbur. "'Would you like to go with me to see them?' Color stole up into Bert's face, "'and he brushed the clinging soil from his hands. "'Yes. "'No,' he said. "'I'm going to Boston this afternoon,' "'continued Philip, in a quiet, matter-of-fact tone. "'The ladies would like to have you come with me.' "'No,' returned the boy. I have to... to wait here for... for Uncle Nick. Oh, he's there, too, returned Philip. They've made some plan. We shall all be together there, just as we were here. It won't take you long to get ready. I'll help you. No, said the boy breathlessly. Uncle Nick, but Mrs. Lowell wants you. No, Uncle Nick doesn't want... Mrs. Lowell. Oh, boy... "'You know Mrs. Lowell wouldn't ask you to do anything that would get you into any trouble,' said Philip pleasantly. "'Perhaps your uncle has decided not to come back to the island. At any rate, they want you there in Boston, and they sent me a telegram asking me to bring you. So it's up to us to do what they say. Don't you think so? Come upstairs, and I'll help you get ready.' The boy's stolid habit of obedience stood Philip in good stead now. With heightened color, but no other change in his face, he followed to his room, washed his face and hands, and got into his shabby best while Philip found a comb and brush and toothbrush and put them into a paper parcel. Returning downstairs, 
they found Veronica consuming with curiosity, but considerably entertained by her future dance partner, who was teaching her a new step by means of his blunt fingertips on the porch rail. "'I'm going to take Bert home to dinner with me, Veronica. So say good-bye and expect us when you see us. Where's Miss Burridge?' "'Oh, Aunt Priscilla!' shouted Veronica at the kitchen door. "'Come out! Bertie Gain is going to Boston with Mr. Barrison!' Miss Burridge emerged, wiping her hands on a towel. The other went to meet her. "'How nice!' she said, beaming. "'What a nice outing for Bertie! That's real clever of you, Philip. How'd you happen to think of it?' "'Well, his friends in Boston want him,' said Philip, and he administered a wink which Miss Burridge understood sufficiently to postpone a catechism until later. The boy allowed her and Veronica to shake his passive hand in bidding him good-bye, and then he went away with his companions, with no further questioning. When they were gone, Miss Burridge exclaimed her astonishment. "'Mr. Barrison received a wire, that's all I know,' said Veronica. The youngster's in mortal terror of his uncle. But Mr. Barrison told him his uncle was there, and it was all right. Miss Wilbur, or else Mrs. Lowell, sent the telegram. Sort of queer they should be hobnobbing with old Nick, but perhaps he let him send the wire to save expense. Philip made conscientious efforts to entertain his young charge on their trip. In Portland, where they spent the night, he bought some magazines— naturally guessing that the more filled with pictures they were, the better, and he was puzzled at the evident shrinking from the illustrations that the boy displayed. "'Something is seriously off with that poor little nut,' he thought. "'Any boy likes to look at pictures.' So he left him in peace and let him stare apathetically from the car window all the way to Boston, or doze in his corner." Philip wired Diana just before they took the train, and she ordered luncheon to be served in her rooms. She wished very much that some kind turn of fortune's wheel would call her mother forth to the shops that morning, but by reason of the fragments Mrs. Wilbur overheard, passing between her child and Mrs. Lowell or the lawyer, her curiosity as to this waif who might be going to carry on the luring fortunes became sufficiently vivid to determine her to remain where she could oversee all that her daughter did. "'Who did you say is bringing the boy on?' she asked Diana that morning. "'His name is Parison.' "'You wired him to do this?' "'Yes, Mama. "'How could you ask it? Is he a servant?' "'No, Mama. He is a professional singer, taking his vacation at the island.' Mrs. Wilbur looked at the girl closely. "'You must have become rather friendly with him to ask such a favor. Mrs. Lowell glanced up from a glove she was mending. "'Everybody is friendly at the island, Mrs. Wilbur. It is one of the assets of the simple life. As one of the men at the inn said, every time you go out the door, you wade up to your knees in the milk of human kindness.' Mrs. Wilbur regarded her coldly. "'An inexperienced schoolgirl cannot discriminate,' she said. "'I felt all the time that Diana should not go there.' Her dominating tone was significant of the relation she, contrary to the experience of most American mothers, had succeeded in retaining with her daughter. The average American girl of Diana's age— would have had no difficulty in telling her mother that the expected boy would be embarrassed by the presence of a stranger, and requesting her, more or less agreeably, to return to her apartments. Not so Diana. Her mother plied her now with additional questions about Herbert Loring's heir. "'For mercy's sake!' said Mrs. Wilbur at last. I should judge from what you say that the boy isn't far off melancholia. Mrs. Lowell sighed unconsciously. Mrs. Wilbur heard her, but did not understand the reason for it. Well, don't ask me to lunch with him. 
I am sure he would make me nervous, added the lady. I think it quite likely he would, Mama, said her daughter dutifully, one of her problems disappearing. There certainly will be an interesting evolution observable in him very soon, but just at first his limitations might annoy you. Well, I'll just stay long enough to look at him, and then I will go, returned Mrs. Wilbur. End of chapter 15